morning, everyone. Um, hope you're waking up after last night and ready for a good conversation with Zishan. Um, so let's start at the beginning, just in case people aren't familiar with MoonPay and what you do. Do you want to give a brief introduction? Absolutely. Um, so, so MoonPay is what we, as a tagline, call a Web3 infrastructure company. Now, what that means, so it's useful to talk through the journey for MoonPay a little bit to talk about how we ended up there. Um, we started off as an infrastructure company for crypto businesses. Any crypto business that wants to operate ends up having to invest in a significant amount of regulatory stack, infrastructure operations that takes a lot of time and effort and, and money to get up and running. So we, we launched as a business that was this shared layer, which this turnkey layer that you could enable to accelerate your go-to-market times in a, in a compliant manner from like a year and a half to a few hours. And we've followed that journey as the Web3 ecosystems evolved. We've added to that stack. We found that 80% of it applied to this emerging space for NFTs. Um, and we've continued to build on that. So we are today what I would describe as a end-to-end um, -end Web3 infrastructure company. We, we come in, we've even got a division now called MoonPay Studios, and, and that's designed to be really the first point of contact where a brand or a creator is thinking about Web3, and, and the studios team can then go in, help formulate that strategy, then provide the building blocks, the regulatory pieces, so the entire stack that's needed to take uh, your Web3 strategy to market. That's what we do. And before we get into the exciting products that you're launching and how MoonPay is going, I don't think anyone can sit on stage and talk about crypto without talking about FTX and the fallout. Um, and I'm sure everyone's been following that story. But what's your view of what this means for the industry and what it means for MoonPay specifically? Um, I, I think it's, it's incredibly sad what, what's unfolded because I've worked in crypto now for uh, seven years now, and I, I have, um, it's incredibly sad for the people who've been affected by this. There's, I, I have close friends who've lost um, a lot of funds in this process, so um, it's certainly a setback for the space, I feel, and, and I feel for the individuals that have, and, and actually we're seeing the fallout across the ecosystem and other companies as well. So. But it's also a, a moment for us to pause and, and reflect on how you prevent something like this happening again. Um, I think as the contagion spreads and we continue to see this fallout, we realize that there was, I mean, there were bad decisions made, but the system allowed for these to be made. And I, I think moving forward, you'll start to see more regulation in this space. You'll start to see, it, it, historically, if you look, look you know, at whenever a big player in a space catastrophically collapses like this, it's followed by uh, additional regulation scrutiny. And it also creates a, a general sense of awareness, a, a healthy sense of skepticism around how, who you work with. So I think this, if anything, in the long term, will be a turning point for the crypto space in terms of regulation, in terms of who folks trust and how they, they do business. Um, and I think we at MoonPay, for us, it, it's, it's, we continue to build on what we've been building from the start. So MoonPay has always been designed to support businesses that don't have this type of inherent risk. They're generally, we work with, as an example, one of our biggest client base is non-custodial wallets. So all, all of the big non-custodial wallets out there. So we're driving the ownership element of it. Um, and, and that's what we continue to build on. The Web3 piece of the equation, that's honestly less about crypto or NFTs. That's about solving real world use cases. It's about utility. So for us, it, um, for me personally and the people around me, it's been, it's been a tough time. Um, but I think generally for MoonPay, it is uh, heads down, continue to build the right business with the right regulatory framework in terms of what this next era for uh, crypto looks like, for Web3 looks like. So coming back to MoonPay, 
Um, you obviously started in payments and had a phenomenal business there. I mean, the, the, your first institutional round of capital that you raised was at a 3.4 billion post, and uh, you had the financial profile to prove it. You were doing exceptionally well. Your customers included the likes of OpenSea and SoRare and others. Um, and then you came to the market with another equally exciting product, which has potentially even bigger application than the MoonPay core products. You launched HyperMint, which is a platform that allows brands to create, manage, mint uh, NFTs. Um, and before this, we were kind of thinking, well, uh, NFTs just digital, digital collectibles? Are they just meant to be PFPs? What's, what's the use case of them? But you've been having some really exciting conversations with brands. You've launched with Universal. Tell us more about HyperMint um, and the applications or use cases that you see for NFTs going forward. Yeah, absolutely. So. Crypto's and the space is quite nerdy. We, we like to use a lot of technical terms like smart contracts and blockchain and NFTs. It's just, it, it's quite nerdy. We, and we like our, uh, our, our we, we like these, this sort of terminology. And I think what we were trying to achieve with Hypermint was to bridge between the technology and the infrastructure with a mainstream enterprise solution that abstracts away all of that complexity and focuses on the problem, the challenge that a creator or a brand is trying to solve for. So you could, when we launched HyperMint at NFT NYC, we, we did a drop while, during the announcement and we wrote a smart contract right while we were there. And I think that's what it does. It, it, it demystifies and takes away all of that complexity and turns it into a simple, product that is designed for both everything from individual creators, musicians, artists, the full spectrum, all the way to mainstream brands. So we've partnered with, as you said, Universal, we're doing a, and we're exploring lots of really interesting use cases. So while it may have kicked off with some, with some you know, again, nerdy photos and, and JPEGs to begin with, but it's turned into um, utility use cases with the likes of Universal, who uh, we did a small project with uh, around folks that take rides at two of Universal's parks, for example. Um, we're doing, we're working on memberships, token-gated memberships. We're working on um, a, a really broad spectrum of use cases around even things like with Aloe Yoga for um, cert certificates of authenticity. So we're trying to and the narrative isn't about what can you do with NFTs. The narrative is what problem are you trying to solve for and how this technology can help you. So we're trying to also shift the conversation from, hey, we've got some cool tech, to actually we have a solution that could supercharge loyalty, that could supercharge memberships. It could strengthen the relationship with um, folks that your customers and your brand followers. And it's still very early for this space. So I'm sure you know there's still a lot of skepticism or brands don't quite ha know how to use the technology. What are the biggest challenges that you need to get them to overcome in the conversation and what are they hesitant about? Yeah. Um, it's funny. So the number of people or brands and conversations where we've had uh, where people have turned up and said, we'd, we'd like to do something in Web3. But that's as far as the conversation's gone, in the sense that they haven't, they haven't planned out what they'd like to do. It's, it became a buzzword, and it was something that everyone wanted to get involved in, but didn't really quite understand it, or didn't really know what they wanted out of it. So we've been working um, with several brands in helping. So again, MoonPay Studios, it, it, a lot of what we've created came out of necessity. So while we were offering a technical tool, people were, were trying to use it, but they didn't quite, they weren't quite sure on how to apply it. So we had to create studios that helps create that strategy for the brand in terms of what KPIs, what metrics are they working towards. It's, it's ideation in that sense. So what we're finding is, Again, we're shifting the narrative from, oh, I want to be in Web3 because it's cool, to um, here's a use case that might be useful for your type of product in line with your objectives. So, and once we've established that, you can then start to go, 
uh, we've got the, the fiat rails, the licenses, the minting infrastructure, the, the full stack that's needed to go then execute on that. So that's how we're finding our engagement with brands. And, and I have to say, some of them have been incredibly refreshing. So uh, we've got one huge brand um, that actually uh, name dropped us, uh, but we're not allowed to talk about it, but they mentioned Nike mentioned us in a uh, Twitter space um, where um, I, you know there's a lot of coverage around their strategy and the, the dot swoosh IDs that they're launching today. So um, I think it's t those types of use cases which are we, don't even contain the word NFT. It's about delivering an experience, and um, that's what we're helping brands realize. And coming back to MoonPay um, and the original product, I mean, one of the questions uh, that was often asked was like, you know, what do you, what's the value that MoonPay is providing for your partners and merchants? Because you've got some really big ones, as we mentioned, like OpenSea, but then you've got lots of small startups coming to market and wanting to facilitate their customers being able to exchange fiat to crypto. Perhaps break it down for the audience, like why use MoonPay? Yeah. So... Just, I guess, in order to answer that question, I'll, I'll tell you my story in the sense that um, I was CEO for Coinbase's international operations, and I was the first employee, and I, was, I spent the next four years fighting to build infrastructure. It was convincing banks that we're not a shady operation. It was convincing payments providers to not off-board us at 30 days' notice. It was convincing regulators. So, but all of that effort and work was, was contained to lift the Coinbase ecosystem. MoonPay, we're building that exact same stack. We're, we're building all of those constituent parts that businesses need but anybody can build on it. So it's not a walled garden the way it is uh, in, say, the way ex some exchanges do it. Um, and that, to me, felt incredibly powerful because, you know, you could, you could accelerate the pace of innovation if somebody could come up with an idea and take it to market in, in two weeks rather than if anyone's gone through a regulatory application, you'd know what I mean. Rather than spending the next 12 months in filling out forms and interviews and, and policies and procedures. So I think the value, and this extends to NFTs and, and everything that we cover in this space for, for MoonPay is we're not a payment provider. We're not um, a regulatory cover. We're not just a fraud engine. We're all of the above in a plug and play cohesive package that you can just build on top of. I, I, I think that really is the essence of what we try and do. I, I do also think it's incredibly wasteful to imagine if there's a thousand businesses in this space applying for their own licenses, managing them. It's, it's wasteful, it's unnecessary. So I think that's where MoonPay is powerful is that we, we just abstract away that complexity and we help you to build both at, as for small businesses, creators and big brands. And the exciting thing with the launch of Hypermint is that you can now offer to merchants or to partners, I mean, really everything in terms of the suites of products. You need payments or you need your smart contract, et cetera, or the customer doesn't have a wallet or let them spin up a wallet. Um, now you've moved from being payments infrastructure to web three infrastructure, as you call it. How do you think that uh, changes your position in the picks and shovel space in this market? And where do you see your competitive advantages? And how much is brand a part of that? Um, I think in light of events from the last few weeks, brand has become even more important than ever. It's um, our competitive advantage. And, and again, I've seen this in crypto. It's, it sometimes does live up to its reputation of the Wild West in many ways. You get a spectrum of businesses that range from ones that operate out of jurisdictions which are unregulated, obscure, and ones on fully regulated, licensed. So I, I think the MoonPay approach is picks and shovels. We're building the stack that you build on. But we're also, we're not the fastest moving player because we're trying to do things the right way. We've got um, the licenses, again, the, the payments relationships, the banking relationships. So, so, even on the smart contract side, um, it, the internet is littered with stories about exploits and how um, they weren't audited properly, for example. So we're trying to add, bring maturity to this, and that's what we want the brand to represent. We want it to be seen as safe, as 
enterprise grade trustworthy. Um, Here's a small funny story. Like we, so we started in crypto with crypto businesses. Most of the deals we did were with the likes of, say, Telegram. Uh, sorry, were, were done over Telegram, right? You can, you can be texting somebody, you can say, yeah, we'll go with you. We were talking to a brand recently, and they sent us a 200-page InfoSec questionnaire that we'd never seen before. And we had to sit down with the security team to, to run through it, and, and it was all fine. But you know, we're making that transition into working with the bigger brands and having the maturity to, to be able to respond to the questions that's expected of a robust uh, infrastructure stack. So I think that's what we are. That's what we were trying to build. Um, it is picks and shovels. And, and, and the great thing about picks and shovels is we we want the ecosystem to succeed. We're not picking winners. We're not choosing, who, you know, who we work with. It's a as long as you, as long as what you do is, is reasonable and legal, we'll provide the building blocks and the infrastructure for that. And um, you've been through a crypto winter before. In fact, most people at MoonPay have experienced this, and it's a very experienced team. Um, and who knows how next year is going to to look with recent events. What's your advice for, I'm sure there are founders in the audience thinking about building or are building, how to navigate the next, be it months, could be years. Yeah. Um, what's MoonPay's approach going to be next year? So we continue to do, we continue to build on incremental gains on what we've done so far. So um, we're spending a lot of time, again, going back to my earlier point with brands. So next year, what we expect to happen is, just generally in the crypto space, we expect there to be more regulation. I, I think there's going to be more regulation. Um, I, I think for us is to drive utility and use cases. It's to continue doing the types of um, partnerships that we've done in the later half of this year into next year. I, I would love to move away from conversations around NFTs and more around we can supercharge loyalty for you or we can create a, a, a new style of membership program for you. I, I also, and, and this is more of a personal opinion, I also think developments around the metaverse are exciting and I'm not endorsing the Facebook side of things over here, I'm just talking about the concept of the metaverse and I think being able to express an identity and being able to have ownership in this emerging universe is, is incredibly powerful. And NFTs are, and blockchain and, and token-based ecosystems, they're the building blocks. They're the foundational pieces you need for that to exist. So our focus is in continuing to build reliable infrastructure for that, um, that, that allows the ecosystem to continue pushing the boundaries and innovate. And another common factor bonding the audience today and for yourself as well is building in Europe. As you mentioned, you were previously CEO of Coinbase Europe um, and now MoonPay's origins are in Europe as well. Talk about the crypto ecosystem over here versus in the US and what are the advantages of being central to Europe? So I spent a lot of time split between San Francisco and being over here. Um, if I can express an opinion, I, I like the ecosystem here a little bit more. So, that, so one of the d big d differences I see here uh, between the two is um, the Silicon Valley approach is incredibly blue sky, and it's you know y you're aiming for really the stars. Whereas, and, and often there's not there's not thoughts around monetization or revenue. It's about how can you capture as much as quickly as possible. Whereas I think the European approach is a little bit more balanced. Um, I, I think, so, so MoonPay as an example. MoonPay was revenue generating right from the start. It was, it was bootstrapped, it made money as a business. So for me personally, if you should always start off with a an eye on the future on how something's going to turn into a business. And I see more of that in the European crypto ecosystem. I, I have friends, I, I am an advisor to a whole host of businesses in this space, and um, they're heads down, they're a little bit more um, subtle, but they're still building at the same scale and pace as you're seeing in the US. So 
Um, you have hubs. So MoonPay's now got, we've got what we call moon bases, and we've now got them in Barcelona, in Lisbon, and London. So we've, we've kind of found those three to be the, the, the homes of the most talent. So um, it's, I find it exciting to be here in Europe. I find the, the culture and the, the entrepreneurial spirit to be as powerful as anywhere else in the world. And as you've leveled up and bring in, brought in some amazing talent for the C-suite and your exec team, that's actually shifted towards the US. And I think a common situation for companies to find themselves in in scale-ups in Europe is that the, the more senior talent inevitably ends up being from the US. How did you think about that journey to finding your CTO, your COO? So, Hiring was hard up until maybe six months ago. It was, it was really a, a, an employee-driven market. And um, I had fairly humble beginnings, but when I looked at some of the exact numbers and, and asks that were coming out, I was, I was blown away. It, it, it was tough. Um, it's also tough hiring for, we're not a big business. We're not thousands of people. We're, we're about 300 people. Um, and we're not like a 20-person startup. So you're, you're looking, we're, we're in that awkward teenage phase, we're in between. And um, so you're finding people who've got the experience of taking the company to the next phase, but who are also willing to roll their sleeves up and work on a spreadsheet with me to figure out what went wrong. Um, you know, so that's a difficult type of talent pool to find from an exec point of view. You'd layer on crypto and Web3 and all of that together, and it's, uh, it was challenging. So um, we're lucky. We've hired some good people. We, um, again, I think the fundamental for the business was strong. So we were financially sound. Um, we also had a good business model, and there was, there was a clearly a vision on how to solve the challenges that the space uh, is facing. And then um, we ended up creating the right sort of, finding the right sort of structures for how to bring execs in, in terms of uh, educating, onboarding, how to help them think about what they do to get the business, to, to integrate into the business. Um, and that's kind of been it. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a, I, I wish I could say we applied this formula and, and everyone should do this. It, it, was, it was really just looking for the right person and, Fingers crossed. Fingers crossed, indeed. <laughs> and you mentioned these hubs, which is something we're increasingly seeing with startups who want to have a remote-first culture, but people still want the one-to-one -one interaction. It's important for gelling as a team. Tell us a bit how the hub model works yeah. and why the hubs you selected. So, MoonPay was a COVID baby. We were, we were, we were born in the, uh, during COVID as a remote business. That actually, what I didn't realize, so in my previous roles, we'd gone through transitioning to some sort of remote culture. You're making a transition, so you're, you're changing a mindset. But if you're born as a remote business, actually, the, the disciplines and the habits and the practices were all designed for a remote business. So we've actually been quite effective. So I, I, to give you an example, I live in Spain, our CFO lives in the UK, our CEO is in Miami. So we're a fairly distributed business. Our CTO is in San Francisco, uh, across different time zones, and we've, we've found a rhythm on how to make that work. However, there is something to be said to sit across somebody, shake their hand, and to spend some time working with them. So we're, we found this uh, model where we've created these moon bases, and we use them as hubs for us to come together. So that's where usually most of our teams are concentrated. So what we're doing is we're creating a almost like a co-creation space for the teams to come together. There's no obligation to be in the office, but in this space, uh, we're trying to find the balance between being remote, but also being able to come into an office and work together. And you're still going to be hiring next year. Um, MoonPay's story is still one of growth. Let's leave this in a word of positivity and for others. And why are you still excited about the future of crypto? Like, why are we going to, you know, MoonPay's big vision is bring the next billions into Web3. Why does that still hold true for the next decades? So, it's not really about crypto. It's not really about the tech. It's about what we can do with it. I, I think we're, there's a natural fit for use cases that we are driving, and, and that's what is exciting for us. Also, every time you shake out the bad actors, 
that ultimately long term that's a good thing like that is, that that for me is right now is a great opportunity for us to double down on what we what we've done what we feel good about and continuing to solve real problems as we have conversations so um, almost, we almost feel like we've got responsibility to continue, you know, uh, building the right type of infrastructure that the next version of crypto is going to need. Wonderful. Zizran, thank you so much. Thank you to our wonderful audience. Thanks for having me.